Paul Mercury Station, stand by for status report. February 20th, 1962. Friendship 7, Friendship 7. At the height of the Cold War, a countdown for democracy begins. Data check, pressure's 82. Locks tanking, you are go. Order systems, go. Great operation, oh. Astronaut John Glenn is about to be launched into the icy unknown. All pre-start panel lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject Mercury umbrella T minus 18 seconds and counting engine start. Glenn will be the first to ride atop the powerful and dangerous Atlas rocket, a missile that has frequently exploded during test launches. He had to have a lot of guts to get up on top of that rocket. 15 seconds. Glenn will be the first American to orbit the Earth. 10, 9, 8. I don't remember breathing. It's, it's like time stopped. John Glenn is the man upon whose shoulders rests the future of the United States space program. Three, two, one. Godspeed, John Glenn. October 4th, 1957. While America sleeps, a Soviet R-7 missile breathes fire. Atop the rocket is a 184-pound satellite named Sputnik. The Soviet's chief rocket engineer tells his countrymen the assault on space has begun. Within minutes, Sputnik is orbiting 500 miles above the Earth, broadcasting two continuous radio signals. The reaction around the world is an odd mix of excitement and fear. The Russians demonstrated they had a rocket that could travel intercontinental distances and go across oceans and it could hit us. The Americans are especially shaken. Through two world wars, no nation has ever violated the airspace of the continental United States. Now Sputnik sails over America every hour and 35 minutes. When people in the United States, particularly the politicians, looked up and saw this thing going over, that sort of scared everybody. So what could it do? Could it drop a bomb on us? Could it take pictures of us? Is it spying on us? What could it do? I think we had always considered ourselves as, you know, we're American, we're ahead of everybody in this world with technology and research. And all at once, here were the Russians. We had looked at them as a bunch of sort of backward Bolsheviks, I guess, more than anything else. They had outdone the United States of America in a technical field, and a big one. And that was a blow to us in this country. While the Soviet successes leave most Americans demoralized, they leave Major John Glenn energized. Glenn already is a national hero, an ace pilot who distinguished himself during World War II and the Korean War. In July of 1957, Glenn became the fastest pilot in America after flying his F-8U Crusader coast to coast in a record-breaking three hours and 23 minutes. Glenn dubbed his flight Operation Bullet and averaged a supersonic speed of more than 700 miles per hour. In 1950s America, John Glenn was mom, apple pie, and the 4th of July all rolled up into one. Well, he was outgoing, and he cut a very dashing figure. He's ambitious. He's an attractive fellow. He was more famous, to me at least, for his participation in, I think, Name That Tune. 
This is Eddie Hodges, the 10-year-old schoolboy, and here is his partner, Major John Glenn Jr., the Marine Corps jet pilot. Tonight, they're Despite his exploits, at the time, most Americans know of Glenn from the popular game show. Name that tune! In a three-week period, Glenn and his partner, Eddie Hodges, who would later star on stage and screen, rack up $25,000. Name this tune. You know the name of that song? Amaryllis. Amaryllis is right! The winnings are enough for Glenn to pay for his children's college education. But Glenn has much more on his mind than naming tunes. He sees space travel as the ultimate challenge. Well, it was sort of the next step. It was a natural step on from, where I'd, from what I'd been doing, out of uh, combat and uh, then doing test work. And this appeared, at least, to be almost the ultimate in, in test. Uh, testing of aircraft or moving not just aircraft but into a spacecraft. December 6, 1957. America's answer to Sputnik is a satellite called Vanguard. After the Sputnik success, an American admiral remarked that almost anybody could launch a hunk of iron. Vanguard never rises higher than four feet. headlines all over the world was Ike's Flopnik, uh, you know, things like that were coming out, uh, 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 no-go Sputnik, and things like that. It was, uh, there were just all kinds of uh, headlines around the world just making fun of the Americans. January 1958. It is at Cape Canaveral, an alligator-infested swampland on the Florida coast, that the United States plans to even the score with the Soviets. America's hopes ride on a modified version of the German V-2 called the Redstone. January 31st, a Redstone rocket roars from the Cape Canaveral launch pad. The Redstone thrusts a basketball-sized satellite called Explorer 1 into orbit. The satellite does more than circle the Earth. It restores vanquished American pride. That's when it was decided that we would try to put a man in space. And I think the Russians determined that about the same time, to put a man in space. And then we were, so it became a space race in, in the eyes of the press. And indeed, it was some kind of a race. To the Soviets, it's hardly a race. They were the first to put a satellite into space. Now they dream of putting a man into orbit. And once again, the Soviets are determined to beat the Americans to the punch. What does the term going barber pole mean to an astronaut? The answer when Return to Orbit continues. Return to Orbit is sponsored in part by Lincoln Automobiles and by Motrin IB. elementary school teachers to try Motrin IB instead of Advil. This is the place for headaches. I got a real whopper of a headache right now. We thought this would be the perfect place to try Motrin IB. I get aches and pains all day long. Nothing, not even Advil, has been proven to work better than Motrin IB. Okay. Doctors have prescribed the medicine in Motrin IB more than any other pain reliever. My headache is gone. Feel better. Beautiful. Now it's Motrin IB, spoken here. I could teach another 20 years this stuff. Maybe not. If you could accompany your data on this trip overseas, the experience would be alarming. Local carriers handing it to national carriers, over to cable carriers, until you don't know who has your data. Unless you send it through here. 
with the one and only company that owns the entire network, local, national, and international. So you know who has your data. On net from MCI Worldcom. Good financial decisions require expertise. Life needs flexibility. Success demands leadership. If there's something you want to achieve, the principal has one word of advice. Plan a financial strategy for yourself or your business. Start today. 1-888-506-PLAN. Plan ahead, get ahead. The Principal Financial Group. One anniversary card with two tickets to Indy inside. $3,500. Caravan to the Blue City. $64. Boat to the Palace on the Lake, $28. 25 years. More better than worse. Priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's Platinum MasterCard. With a high spending limit for the things that matter. Thursday at 10.30 Pacific. Discovery News takes you live to the shuttle launch from Cape Canaveral as an American icon returns to space. In 1962, President Kennedy banned John Glenn from space travel in hopes of preserving a bona fide hero. 36 years later, he's going back. Still a hero, still made of the right stuff. John Glenn, a pioneer returns, live. Thursday at 10.30 Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. And the Halloween Haunted Costume Castle, your one-stop Halloween shopping store. We have Orange County's largest selection of adult and children's costumes, hats, wigs, masks, makeup, accessories, and decorations. If you can't find it here, it probably doesn't exist. Come in today and outfit the entire family. Costume Castle has six convenient locations to serve you. Laguna Hills Mall, Mission Viejo Mall, Tustin Marketplace, Crossroads Center Irvine, Fashion Island Newport Beach, and the Irvine Spectrum. Call 1-800-70-TREAT today. Currently on display at Sterling BMW's beautiful two-story showroom. Orange County's finest collection of BMWs in every color and style. Come test drive the ultimate driving machine and discover for yourself just how affordable perfection can be. With a number of special leasing and financing programs available, you'll save plenty of silver dollars at Sterling BMW, located at 3000 West Pacific Coast Highway in beautiful Newport Beach. What does the term going barber pole mean to an astronaut? It's when instrumentation readings go out and the normally white field under control switches is replaced by black and white stripes. Not a pretty sight when traveling at over 17,500 miles per hour. Now back to return to orbit. April 9th, 1959. Today we are introducing to you these seven men who have been selected to begin training for orbital space flight. They are the chosen. Seven men selected by NASA to beat the Soviet Union into space. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. Associated Press Aerospace writer Howard Benedict. They introduced them as if they were the biggest heroes that ever lived, you know, and that they had never done anything. People in the audience were screaming and yelling, and they were rushing forward, and the newsmen were making fools of themselves, tumbling all over each other. It was just a big, chaotic scene, because these were the guys who were going to carry us into space. The press anoints them the Mercury Seven. Deke Slayton, Helen Shepard, Gordon Cooper, Wally Shira, Scott Carpenter, Gus Grissom, and John Glenn. Annie Glenn supported her husband first as a fighter pilot, then as a test pilot. But she is apprehensive about his new venture. Well, I can remember uh, when he told me that he was among the, the early ones being considered to be an astronaut, and I never had heard that word before, and uh, I had to learn how to even spell astronaut. America.
America christens its manned space program Mercury after the Roman messenger of the gods. Most Americans see this side of Project Mercury, smiling, confident astronauts posing for the cameras. Seven men with the right stuff, training for the rigors of space travel. But there's a side of Project Mercury that is hidden from most Americans. Almost half of America's test launches end in disaster. flight director Chris Kraft. I was at Cape Canaveral and watched many a failure. There I watched rockets come up and go the opposite direction than they were supposed to go. I watched rockets come off the, off the, off the pad and get to 10,000 feet and explode. We were impressed by the fact that these things could cause mayhem. Astronauts would come down and they see a launch and they see a blow up and they see a launch and another launch and maybe another blow up. So, uh, needless to say, uh, the question came up who really wants to be an astronaut? I still recall the, the very first time after the seven of us had gotten into the program and they we'd been in a few months and they decided they were going to take us down to the Cape to see a missile launch. Five, four, three, two, one, the flames is beautiful and up goes the missile and we're watching it go up like this overhead and it hit 35,000 feet and blew. looked like the atomic bomb went off over our heads. And so we all looked at each other and uh, sent the engineers back to the drawing boards again as to what the problem was. And just when it seems that things cannot get worse, the Soviets strike again. April 12th, 1961, 27-year-old Yuri Gagarin climbs the stairs to an SS-6 intercontinental ballistic missile rocket. He crawls inside a capsule called Vostok. 900,000 pounds of thrust rocket Gagarin into space. Within minutes, Vostok 1 is orbiting the Earth at a speed of 17,000 miles per hour. Once again, America is stunned. No one is more crushed than the Mercury astronauts. The Americans and Soviets, too, like to be first. And they gave us, uh, they drew a line in the sand, you know, and that... And that was what we thought about. We don't want to be second anymore. We want to get there first. John Glenn tells the press they just beat the pants off us. And there really was a serious fear uh, that the communists were getting ahead around the world. And we were part of that. We were part of coming back from that. And then they had orbited when we couldn't do it. And they had even sent people around the world, uh, manned spacecraft, and we hadn't been able to do that yet or come close to it. And so there was a low point in the American psyche here that I think people today tend to overlook and forget. 
The Vostok success forces the United States to once again play catch up. To match the Soviets, the United States must put a man into space, and soon. But who will that man be? NASA's keeping it a secret. For the press, the obvious choice is the all-American John Glenn. May 5th, 1961, just three weeks after the Vostok success, the Americans attempt to even the score. Stepping into the glare of the television lights is not John Glenn. NASA chooses Alan Shepard, a hotshot Navy test pilot said to have ice in his veins. Shepard sits atop the Redstone, the only rocket that NASA engineers feel confident enough to risk a man's life. At 9.30 a.m., the Redstone's internal pumps begin to thunder. The launch of Freedom 7 is perfect. At a speed of 2,700 miles an hour, Shepard races into space. At 117 miles above the Earth, the roar of the rockets subside. Freedom 7, with Alan Shepard aboard, has entered space. The flight of Freedom 7 is a grand success, but the score with the Soviets is hardly even. The Redstone rocket Shepard rode only had enough thrust to reach a suborbital path that barely grazed the edge of space. The Soviets, meanwhile, proved that their more powerful boosters can rocket a man into orbit. While Gagarin's orbital flight into space lasted two hours, Shepard's suborbital journey lasted just under 16 minutes. To truly match the Soviets, the United States must put a man into orbit Astronaut Scott Carpenter. Well, it's the next step, and it's something we had to do because the Russians had done it and because it was part of our plan. And that's the whole key to spaceflight is, uh, at that time, Earth orbit. To launch a man into orbit, the United States counts on one of its most powerful but unproven rockets. The astronaut chosen to fly atop this dangerous booster is John Glenn. What is air glow? The answer when Return to Orbit continues. You can feel it start to burn all through here. All you can think about is getting rid of it quickly. I even tried Zantac 75, but it didn't work fast enough. Finally, I asked my doctor, and my doctor said my Lanta. Fast-acting my Lanta was made to work fast where heartburn hurts most. Soothing on contact. It's so fast. My doctor said my Lanta. And if you suffer from gas, there's a Mylanta just for you. Mylanta Gas. <laughs> Looks like Taz just got his AT&T phone bill. Taz, don't you make a lot of calls on Sunday? Yeah, Taz call, Taz call. Then use MCI five cents Sundays. It's just five cents a minute every Sunday. AT&T charges three times as much. <laughs> Sunday. Become MCI customer. Yeah. Time for
for a Pentium II processor. Coming up next, join American Andy Thomas as he makes history training and living aboard the space station Mir as a Russian cosmonaut. As our return to orbit special continues, next on the Discovery Channel, explore your world. See the actual plaster casts and deformed skeleton of the Elephant Man as doctors re-diagnose his tragic disorder. The true story of the Elephant Man on Sidetrack. Next Monday at 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific on the Discovery Channel. What is air glow? A thermospheric emission phenomena seen by most astronauts as a beautiful thin band of light just above the horizon during orbital darkness. For the latest news on John Glenn's upcoming mission, visit discovery.com. Now back to return to orbit. The Atlas rocket. It is with this temperamental and thin skinned rocket that the future of the US space program rests. The Atlas is nothing more than a giant balloon of pressurized gases held together by a paper-thin stainless steel shell. It's the only rocket in NASA's arsenal powerful enough to launch a man into orbit. And so you might say, well, did it frighten us? I think it developed a certain amount of re respect as far as we were concerned for the fact that we were flying on a very lethal bomb. The problems with the Atlas are accentuated when the weight of the Mercury capsule is placed on top of it. Of the first three Mercury Atlas test launches, two and in catastrophe. Flying on top the Atlas is an assignment John Glenn savors. He's confident, but also understands the tremendous risks. Glenn's good friend is Project Mercury engineer, Gunther Venn. We were talking about what happened if he does not uh, come back. Well, I said, John, we need to make provisions that if you don't come back, it could then be that one, the launch crew will never give a go for another launch. Everybody will be so cautious that we never get a launch off the pad. And secondly, somebody has to tell your family. So uh, without going into details, we made provisions for that, that he would not come back. Annie Glenn is haunted by the image of her husband lost in space. The one fear that I, that I can remember, wonder if they couldn't get, wonder if he was going to be up there going round and round and round and they couldn't bring him in. I think that was, that was one of the things that was really on my mind. Annie Castor and John Glenn are childhood sweethearts from New Concord, Ohio, a coal rich cocoon of American patriotism. They married in 1943 and have two children, Lynn and David. To prepare for the upcoming mission, the Glens travel to Cape Canaveral to witness an Atlas test launch. And we went down at night to the, to the beach to watch, and it got about, I don't know, 200 feet, 300 feet, I don't know, some distance off the pad and blew up. I can remember being shocked and stunned and overwhelmed and, um, and questioning both, of my, both my mom and dad about 
um, whether this was going to happen to him. September 1961. Glenn takes his family to a picnic at Great Falls Park near their Virginia home. It's one of the last times they're together as a family before the orbital flight. And he brought up the possibility that he might die. And that was the first time we talked about that. And um, he didn't want Dave and me to be angry at mother or angry at NASA or blame the government or blame anybody if he would die. Um, he wanted us to remember that it was something that he was doing because he believed in it and it was what he needed to do. February 20th, 1962. The skies are clear. The sea is smooth. The flight of the capsule Glenn names Friendship 7 is a go. All as he climbs inside Friendship 7, the eyes of the world are on John Glenn. When the final moment comes and all the last handshake is done, you, and they put the hatch on and they're working that through and, and they get all the bolts uh, in place, that's sort of a defining moment for you, I think. You know it's for real at that point, you're getting ready to go. Minus two minutes. Starting point for Glenn is alone. Parking control is go. The clock is running. Minus the Mercury control patches through a special phone call. It's his wife, Annie. He said that he was just going down to the corner to, to get chewing gum. That brings tears to my eyes even now, because I didn't know maybe that was going to be our last uh, conversation. T minus 18 seconds and counting engine start. As liftoff nears, a voice interrupts the count. You've got speed, John Glenn. It's Glenn's good friend and fellow astronaut, Scott Carpenter. Do you think about the speed this man is going to achieve pretty quick? And it was just uh, sort of an automatic statement slash prayer that came to me. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, ignition. I was surprised that there was so much smoke that came up and the steam. I didn't expect that. And I thought he'd blown up. It was beautiful, and it, but I held my breath every bit of the way. I could, I, all I could think of was all of those atlases I'd seen blow up. There's some vibration area coming up here now. Thank you. Thank you. Roger, reading a loud and clear, John. Viewing the launch on television from the Virginia home is Glenn's family. 14-year-old Lynn can hardly watch. Somebody said to me, well, aren't you excited? It's those extremes. It's excitement, but it's also not knowing whether to be ha um, happy, sad, mad, glad, grief, or, or, or excitement. Either it can be, it's that fantasy, it, it, will, it will either be one of the most incredibly joyful days of your life, or it will end your life, and your life will never be the same again. Go 
and I am uh, capsule is in good shape. Uh, Roger, seven, you have a go, at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go, uh, at least seven uh, orbits. orbits. They are the words America has been waiting three years to hear. When they had engine cut off, I was, and they said he was in orbit, I was just the happiest man in the world. Oh, that view is tremendous. The euphoria is short-lived. Friendship 7, Friendship 7. A chilling alarm in Mercury control stuns NASA engineers. The flight of Friendship 7 is about to become a full-scale emergency. What is the temperature in space? The answer when Return to Orbit continues. MCI Five Cent Sundays. Five. I need passion, depth, I need intensity. MCI Five Cent Sundays. Five cents a minute Cut. every Sunday. Think big. Think Shakespeare. Five cents a minute every Sunday. Five cents a minute every Sunday. I ask for an actor. They send a comedian. Call 1-800-SUNDAYS to become an MCI customer. Again? Call 1-800-SUNDAYS. elementary school teachers to try Motrin IB instead of Advil. This is the place for headaches. I got a real whopper of a headache right now. We thought this would be the perfect place to try Motrin IB. I get aches and pains all day long. Nothing, not even Advil, has been proven to work better than Motrin IB. Okay. Doctors have prescribed the medicine in Motrin IB more than any other pain reliever. My headache is gone. Feel better. Beautiful. Now it's Motrin IB, spoken here. I could teach another 20 years this stuff. Maybe not. Thursday at 10.30 Pacific. Discovery News takes you live to the shuttle launch from Cape Canaveral as an American icon returns to space. In 1962, President Kennedy banned John Glenn from space travel in hopes of preserving a bona fide hero. 36 years later, he's going back. Still a hero, still made of the right stuff. John Glenn, a pioneer, returns live. Thursday at 10.30 Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. Hello, I'm Don Wagner. I'm running for trustee of the South Orange County Community College District. It's time for fiscal conservative leadership to stop the liberal extremism disrupting our colleges. I live, work, and educate my children in Irvine, and I'm working to stop in El Toro Airport. My opponents live in Santa Ana, not South County. As a conservative, I oppose tax and tuition increases and will make student success the top priority. Vote Don Wagner for quality community college education. This Halloween is special at your Nissan retailer because they're dressing up their 99s with an introductory $1,000 cash back. $1,000 on the 99 Maxima, the ultimate in luxury and performance. The 99 Nissan Altima, the already affordable luxury sedan. And the rugged and luxurious 99 Pathfinder. So see your Nissan retailer by November 2nd and get $1,000 cash back on 99 Altimas, Maximas, and Pathfinders. Because it'd be really scary if you missed it. What is the temperature in space? Temperatures in space depend on whether the thermometer is in sunlight or darkness. Near the Earth and Moon, objects in direct sunlight can heat up to temperatures of about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. In the shade, however, objects can get a little cooler, down to around minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Now back to return to orbit. Friendship 7, this is Bouchet Compact. Theory, over. Right here. How you doing, Gordo? We're doing real fine up here. Everything is going very well. John Glenn enters his second orbit. He has no idea there is a possible problem, one that can kill him. An alarm in Mercury control warns that Friendship 7's heat shield is loose. Roger, did you understand that we observe the I read what you got. 
heat shield is the eight inches of ceramic material that separates life from death for John Glenn. When the capsule plunges back into the Earth's atmosphere, it reaches an unfathomable temperature of 3,000 degrees. If the heat shield is indeed loose, John Glenn and Friendship 7 will be reduced to flame and ash. If the heat shield isn't there and we would burn in a spacecraft, uh, there would be, he would not come back alive. The whole spacecraft would disintegrate. It would burn up on re-entry. We haven't made up our mind on this. We're discussing it. Mercury Control scrambles for answers. Well, we're still talking here. Uh, well, I want an answer right now. You going to give me an answer or do I make the decision myself? I, I'm just inclined to say leave the pack on, Chris, myself personally. Flight director Chris Kraft hopes that the problem is nothing more than a faulty switch, but he prepares for the worst. I think there were a lot of people that thought we might burn a hole in the heat shield of the spacecraft. You want to re-enter with the pack? I, 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 can't, I can't get any comments out of people here. Flight engineers agree that Friendship 7's only hope is to leave the retro package, a set of three small rockets, attached during re-entry. The retros are designed to be jettisoned after firing the capsule back into the Earth's atmosphere. NASA engineers hope that leaving the retros strapped on will help hold the loose heat shield in place. Well, if you get either a green or a red light, then we want to re-enter with the pack on. Kraft decides not to alarm Glenn by telling him about the potential problem. However, Glenn senses something is seriously wrong. You haven't had any uh, banging noises or anything of this type at higher rates. Negative. Well, it wasn't just suspicion. I knew from what the questions they were asking, I knew what they, they had to be thinking about because the questions they were asking and the questions about what indications I had up there could only have meant one thing, that something was wrong with the heat shield. Will you confirm that your landing bag switch is in the off position, over? Uh, that is affirmative. Landing bag switch is in the center of the off position. They were concerned that they not, they not overburdened me with things that were going to be, you know, to tell somebody up there, look, you may be going to burn up on re-entry. That sort of concentrates your attention, I agree. Glenn is not the only one kept in the dark. NASA does not tell the hundred million people gathered around televisions in their homes or in places like Grand Central Station. Among those watching is Glenn's family. NASA calls to tell them of the problem. I think that the discussion about his potential death um, and that phone call um, were, it was like static. It's like it doesn't fit for a child's knowing. It, um, I sure knew the reality, the potential of it from the talk we'd had. Um, but I also knew that there was nothing I could do. As Glenn prepares to plunge back to Earth, NASA gives him new instructions. Flight time, 4 hours, 33 minutes. Friendship 7's retro rockets fire at 5 second intervals. Are they ever? It feels like I'm going back toward Hawaii. Don't do that. You want to go on the East Coast. Like a meteor falling from the sky, Friendship 7 dives toward the Earth at 5,000 miles an hour. Fire envelops the capsule. Friendship 7 begins to shake violently. Glenn hears a banging on the spacecraft. Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. During re-entry, though, when these chunks started coming back, uh, I couldn't be sure whether it was the retro pack or the heat shield, and those were some moments of great concentration on what was going on, to put it mildly. 
but there wasn't anything I could do about it. If it was going to burn up, it was going to burn up. Go ahead, Cape. Uh, you're, ground, you're going out. Uh, we recommend that... ...and a half G. Do you understand? At this most critical time of the flight, the very time when Glenn can be incinerated because of a potentially loose heat shield, Radio communication with Mercury Control is lost. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape, over. Friendship 7, as expected, has entered an ionized layer of the atmosphere that makes radio transmissions impossible. Uh, 7, this is Cape, do you read? For 4 minutes and 20 seconds, there is silence. All they can do is wait. It could have killed the whole space program. I mean, if he had, if he had died, uh, you know, the public probably would not let us put another man into space. Uh, and for a long, long time, I mean, there would have been, you know, we've killed a national hero. Uh, I can remember that being the most terrifying for me. And I thought, well, he's gone. It's the quintessential definition of helplessness because there's nothing, there's nothing that you can do. Keep talking now. Uh, friendship 7, this is Kate. Over. I prayed. I prayed. And then... Crackle on the radio. My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. The heat suit is on green, suit is out in reach condition at 10,800 feet in beautiful suit. Suit looks good. down at 10,000 feet is where the main chute uh, came out. And that's one of the prettiest sights I ever saw in my life, too, was going looking out the window here and seeing the, the uh, chute came out. It was a beautiful chute and a pretty sight. Less than five hours after launch, John Glenn is safely back on Earth. Upon inspecting the capsule, NASA learns that the heat shield was not loose. Flight director Chris Kraft had been correct. A faulty switch had caused a false alarm. The flaming chunks Glenn saw fly by the window were in fact burning pieces of the retro pack. When we saw him get out of that spacecraft, we knew everything was okay, and we were that was quite a relief, and, and uh, it was a great day. It certainly was a great day for the country, and a great day for us to have man, uh, the U.S. have their first successful man in orbit. It was a time of triumph eventually for this nation. It was a time of triumph for human intellect. They were heady days. Obviously, I was glad to be back down again, of course, but I think uh, you'd like to go up every day once you've done one of those flights because they're that, that uh, kind of an experience. You just want to repeat it. Glenn has flown back to Cape Canaveral. 
Waiting for him were Vice President Lyndon Johnson and Glenn's family. America has its astronaut back. Lynn, David, and Annie Glenn have their father and husband back. It, it was just good to hold him in my arms. <laughs> he was alive. He was home. He was home. difference in training between today's shuttle crews and the early rocket crews? The answer when Return to Orbit continues. Return to Orbit is sponsored in part by MCI WorldCom, by MasterCard, and by the Principal Financial Group. If you looked into your local carrier's phone lines, what time period would they place your company in? Why live in the past when local's future is right through here? On net, where local, national, and global all flow over one network and by one company. Oh, and did I mention it'll save you money? On net from MCI Worldcom. Nine programs, twenty-seven dollars. Five hot dogs, six pennants, forty-five dollars. One big puffy hand, six dollars. Their first big league ball game, priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard, the card at the heart of Major League Baseball. Good financial decisions require expertise. Life needs flexibility. Success demands leadership. If there's something you want to achieve, the principal has one word of advice. Plan a financial strategy for yourself or your business. Start today. 1-888-506-PLAN. Plan ahead, get ahead. The Principal Financial Group. as he makes history training and living aboard the space station Mir as a Russian cosmonaut as our return to orbit special continues next on the Discovery Channel explore your world Thursday at 1030 Pacific Discovery News takes you live to the shuttle launch from Cape Canaveral as an American icon returns to space in 1962, President Kennedy banned John Glenn from space travel in hopes of preserving a bona fide hero. 36 years later, he's going back. Still a hero, still made of the right stuff. John Glenn, a pioneer returns, live. Thursday at 1030 Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. What do you do when you're trapped clean for life? We're sometimes only given one shot. Stories of endured success. Do you have what it takes? Survive. Sunday, 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific on Discovery Sunday. Only on the Discovery Channel. What's the difference in training between today's shuttle crews and the early rocket crews? Shuttle crews are specifically trained for their onboard tasks, such as payload specialists and flight engineers. Crews from the 60s were all military test pilots who spent a dizzying amount of time in centrifuges to get them acclimated to zero gravity and massive G-thrusts. Now back to return to orbit. He is America's newest hero. In Washington, a quarter of a million people brave a deluge of rain just to catch a glimpse of John Glenn. I think people looked at it as we were finally back in this thing. We were back in it. 
and we're going to make a, a race of this with the uh, Soviets, and we're back, and don't count us out on this thing. The next day in New York City, it rains confetti. Four million people turn out to cheer the astronaut who put America back in the space race. Not since Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic in 1927 has America thrown such a parade. There were pissed people everywhere, up above, all over. I mean, everybody was so excited and ticker tape was just coming down all over the place. I think that's one thing I would like to do over again because I was so excited. I was like a kid in uh, uh, a dream, I guess. John Glenn is unaware that President John F. Kennedy already has decided to ground him from future space flights. The president refuses to risk the life of the man he calls a national treasure. Kennedy urges Glenn to enter the world of politics. The success of Friendship 7 gives NASA newfound confidence. For the first time, the Americans have truly matched the Soviets. The black hole that is space now seems conquerable. People have looked up for how many hundreds of thousands of years and wondered what's up there. And all of us, we come along in, in, uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, we're privileged to start the first little tiny baby steps of going up there to see what's up there. John Glenn's 1962 flight to Friendship 7 was more than a baby step. It was a giant leap into the future. A giant leap toward the moon. some say the moon. Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. To purchase a home video of the program you just saw, call now to order. For only $19.95 plus shipping and handling, you too can become part of the adventure. Journey to our world's farthest corners and beyond. From technology and expedition to the everyday how-to. Make Discovery's critically acclaimed and award-winning programming your very own. Quality and excellence for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Call now to order. There's no thrill like Discovery.